Hi, I'm Nick Bogert. I'm a, a member of the board of the Region of Three Oaks Museum. A couple of quick housekeeping notes before we get to the program. The museum, of course, is closed for the season as of November 1st, but we're going to be scheduling regular Zoom programs like this one uh, through the year, and we hope to stage some periodic live events as well, uh, public health mandates dictating how we can do that. Uh, as you may know, we have a new venue for such program, the Three Oaks Heritage Hall, which is the former township hall, the oldest building in town on Linden Street. The legend over the door says it was built in 1866. I just saw an article by Mary Warren Chamberlain uh, in the Acorn from many years ago that claimed it was built nearly a decade earlier. So I'm, I'm not quite sure about that 1866 date anymore. Um, in any case, we are preparing a special Prancer open house for December 12th, exhibits from the making of the movie Prancer back in 1989. And we're even rehabbing the model. You may remember right at the end, there's a, an aerial shot. Now they do it with a drone and they'd use the actual town. But of course, back in 1989, they made a, a miniature, a fellow from Laporte uh, made an incredible miniature of the village, in some respects very accurate, in some respects not accurate at all. But it's been sitting up in the library gathering dust for several years now, and we're trying to put it back together and we can even turn on the lights there. Randy Miller, one of our board members, um, is the one who's in charge of rehabbing that. And as I said, he's gotten some of the lights to, uh, to work. So we're making progress. And again, that's December 12th, that's the, <clears throat> That's the uh, evening of the Santa parade and, and kids go to Carver Park to see Santa. So this will be right next door. And we're hoping that the public health situation will allow us to, uh, to take in at least some people. We would certainly practice social distancing and, and make use of require masks for people to come in. Um, but we're hoping we can, we can do that. Um, now for our program, uh, Michigan's logging era I saw uh, Hillary Pine do this presentation for the Historical Society of Michigan a couple of weeks ago and really enjoyed it. So I wrote her a fan letter and asked if she'd be willing to reprise the, uh, the talk for us in Three Oaks, in the region of Three Oaks. If you have questions, as always, uh, putting them in the, in the chat would probably be a good idea. And then we can take them when, when Hillary's done. Hillary is the Northern Lower Peninsula Historian for the Michigan History Center and the DNR, Department of Natural Resources. She's responsible for the Hartwick Pines Logging Museum, the Michigan CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps Museum, and the Higgins Lake Nursery. Hillary's worked for a variety of state, federal, and nonprofit organizations, including Mackinac State Historic Parks and the National Park Service. She has a BA in Art History from the University of Michigan, and an MA in Museum Studies and Cultural Heritage from the University of East Anglia, not where everybody from Michigan goes for their graduate degree. We're happy to have her with us. Uh, Hillary, go ahead and take the stage, please. All right, hello everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's nice to see everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. Sometimes it's a bit slow to start the actual slideshow. Uh, come on. There we go. All right, uh, as usual, I think, um, you know, I don't have that many slides or uh, there's no way I can talk for that long. And somehow I always manage to talk longer than I think I'm going to. <laughs> so um, I will, I'll try to get through this as quick as I can, um, you know, be mindful of everyone's time tonight. And, uh, and like Nick said, if you do have questions, please put them uh, in the chat or, or remember them and at the end, uh, We'll, we'll take time for questions. Um, but okay, let's uh, get to it. Uh, so very quickly, early logging in North America really began basically as soon as Europeans came to North America. Uh, they get to the east coast of North America, um, they see all of this very large pine. And when you are a uh, maritime country, something you really value is large timber, because of course it's really great for shipbuilding. So uh, large timber very quickly becomes an important export uh, both to Britain and to Europe. And uh, we get something called the King's Broad Arrow, which if you're familiar with log marks, it's just a very early version of a log mark. 
And uh, essentially on the East Coast, there were forests um, and there was a, a person who was essentially the royal surveyor of, of lumber. And uh, he would go around, he'd put the king's broad arrow onto trees that he thought would be the perfect ship mast. So uh, the king's broad arrow is just a hatchet and the, the, this person would mark um, you know, two marks for the, the top of the arrow and then one mark for the, the shaft of the arrow. And that would tell people uh, that they cannot cut that down that tree, it belongs to the king. Uh, obviously people didn't always <laughs> abide by those rules, but that was the idea. And uh, pretty quickly, East Coast Pine is exhausted. And uh, this map I have here, you can see this dark green color. That's really where white pine likes to grow. You have predominantly sandy soil and uh, sandy acidic soil. So uh, you have Maine, uh, some in New York, Pennsylvania, and pretty quickly that all gets cut. And uh, by the 1830s, 1840s, logging in uh, on a small scale does reach Michigan. And uh, here, this map gives you an idea of what our forests look like before logging happened. So around the 1830s, uh, it, it's estimated that we here in Michigan had about 166 billion board feet of standing pine. Uh, and if you're not familiar, a board foot is just a, a standard measurement of lumber or timber. It is a, a foot wide by a foot long by an inch deep. And uh, uh, to put that into perspective, 166 billion board feet is enough to cover the states of Rhode Island and Connecticut in a wood floor one inch thick. And uh, if we take a look at the map of Michigan on the right, you see this uh, line where it goes from black to this lighter gray, kind of from the Saginaw area down across uh, to Muskegon. And that line, everything north of that line is mostly where we get that acidic soil where white pine likes to grow. And uh, you can see down in your area, on the, the southwest coast, there is a little bit of, of pine, especially uh, right on the coast. Um, so we start out in the 1830s with 166 billion board feet. By 1898, there's only 6 billion board feet left. Uh, so when logging first started in the 1830s, people thought uh, there was enough timber in Michigan that we could log for hundreds of years but obviously that was not the case. And by the 1990s, even after all the reforestation we are going to talk about, Michigan only has about 19.7 million board feet of standing pine. Uh, and that's enough, enough to cover two thirds of a square mile in a wood floor, one inch thick. And uh, all that reforestation we're gonna talk about did happen, but this um, significant decrease in board feet really speaks to the size of the trees, not the amount of them. Um, so in the 1830s, we have very large trees. And when logging first starts in Michigan, 1830s, 1840s, it is very small scale. So this image on the right, uh, the image on the top is what we would call a shanty. And this is a, a recreated logging shanty uh, from a museum in Canada. And uh, log lumberjacks often called themselves shanty boys because when logging first starts, small scale, maybe 10, 12 men, and they all live together in this one shanty. Any cooking, um, blacksmithing, tool repair, sleeping, bathing, laundry, it's all taking place in this one building. Uh, it's very possible any animals, because it's a small scale operation, they'd only have a few horses, a few oxen, uh, very probable those animals would also be living inside this shanty. And from 1840 to 1860, logging proceeds at about the same rate as it did on the East Coast. But in the 1860s, something really big happens, this big national infrastructure project, the Transcontinental Railroad. And all of a sudden there's this huge need for lumber. So often when we think about railroads, we think about the rails themselves and the steel needed for that, uh, but you also need the actual uh, ties 
to make to build the railroad and any bridges you build you're going to need uh, an immense amount of lumber to build all of those uh, trestles. So most of that lumber for the Transcontinental Railroad is coming from Michigan. So all of a sudden there's this huge increase in demand. And in 1871, of course, we have the Great Chicago Fire. So now there's this big city that also needs to be rebuilt. So with demand, with an increase in demand, it's gonna come hopefully an increase in supply. And uh, before we get to that increase in supply, I wanted to touch on uh, some early local logging uh, for you folks. And Nick was so kind to provide, provide me with some local information. So uh, I'll go ahead and just read this. So 18th, in 1836, the Hall, McGiven and Company Sawmill is the first sawmill built in the area. It was built on the South Fork of the Galeen River about two miles east of New Buffalo. In 1847, the first steam sawmill is established on Lake Michigan, just north of Union Pier. And in 1854, Gilbert Avery and Thomas Love build a large steam sawmill on the railroad two miles east of Three Oaks. And the settlement of Avery sprang up around the mill. So now we get into the, the heart of Michigan's white pine logging era, 1860 to 1910. And in 1897, uh, we kind of mentioned at the beginning, 160 billion board feet of lumber has now been cut in Michigan. And from 1870 to 1900, we were the leading producer of lumber in the nation. And by 1910, we had made $4 billion in the logging industry here in Michigan. And that is more money than was made during the entire California gold rush. And a 4 billion in today's dollars is roughly a trillion dollars. So really a huge significant amount of money that uh, grew Michigan's economy. And along with iron ore from Michigan, uh, it's our lumber that is building the national infrastructure. And this photo on the right, uh, some of you may have seen before, it's quite a famous image. And uh, this is what we call the world's fair load or the world record load. And this was Michigan's contribution to the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. Every state contributed something, and this is what we contributed. Uh, this is not a typical load of logs. If, if you were a normal logging operation, you might stack three rows high, like what you see in this photo, three of those rows of logs. Uh, a, a load like this would just be way too unstable uh, and way too heavy for two horses to pull. Uh, but this uh, crew of lumberjacks, to get the world record, they built a special declined ice road so that these horses did actually pull this load a very short distance uh, to get the world record. And they brought this to Chicago. There was like Michigan's uh, pavilion. So at a certain time, you'd go to the pavilion if you were a spectator and you'd watch the lumberjacks put the stack together and then take it apart. So they're just showing off uh, their skill. So we get some, uh, technological advances that happened in the 1870s that allow Michigan to really increase that supply of lumber to meet the demand that is happening. And uh, that first piece of technology are big wheels or Michigan logging wheels. And uh, if you've been to Hartwick Pine State Park where my office is at uh, in Grayling, you will have seen a couple sets of these big wheels. And these existed before the 1870s, but they weren't being mass produced. So over in Manistee, a guy by the name of Silas Overpack, he has a uh, wagon manufacturing company and he starts mass producing big wheels. And what big wheels do for logging is they take a winter only industry and they allow it to happen all year round. If you imagine most Michigan forests in the winter time, all of the brush, any you know, fallen branches on the forest floor, any mud, it's all covered with snow. So you just use a sled to get your lumber in and out, or out mainly, right? <laughs> and uh, these big wheels, it doesn't matter if there's mud or uh, you know, things on the forest floor, these wheels are large enough that they will just go over and through everything. So now you can get your trees out of the forest no matter the time of year. And it also allows logging companies, you know, we get uh, warm-ups a lot of times in January, February, we'll get a warm-up, a lot of our snow will melt. 
So now logging companies, uh, one week they can use their sleds, now the snow melts, and the next week they can go back to using their big wheels. So uh, they're not relying so much on a heavy snow. And the next uh, crucial piece of technology is the cross-cut saw, uh, which of course to us may not seem like technology, um, but to a lumberjack, uh, this significantly uh, improved the speed that they could cut down trees. So prior to this, most lumberjacks would use an ax. He worked with a partner. So taking turns hitting the tree to cut down a good sized white pine, it's gonna take them about an hour to cut down that tree. But now we have this cross cut saw, which has something called a raker tooth, which just like it sounds a rake, it's gonna rake out that sawdust. That saw won't bind in the sawdust in the cut of the tree. And it's only gonna take roughly 15 minutes to cut down that same size white pine. So uh, they've quartered the amount of time it takes to cut down a tree. And every pair of lumberjacks can now cut down four times as many trees every single day. And of course, the narrow gauge railroad. Uh, prior to the narrow gauge becoming uh, popular in Michigan, we could really only log near a navigable water source, whether that be a river or one of the coasts or uh, maybe an inland lake where you have a, a mill located. And uh, that's because, of course, the logs are, are heavy and you have to be able to get them from the forest to the mill uh, in an economical way, in an efficient way. So prior to the 1870s, we have to be, again, near water source to, to get those logs out of the woods efficiently and to the mill. But when the narrow gauge comes into use, now it doesn't matter where those big stands of white pine are. You can go to a place like, again, Hartwick Pines, where we don't have a navigable river nearby, and you can put in narrow gauge, cut down the trees, use the, the railroad to transport your logs to the mill. So now we have uh, big wheels so we can log all year round. We have crosscut saws, which uh, quadruple the amount of trees we can cut down in a day. And we have the narrow gauge railroad so we can cut down trees almost anywhere. And speaking of railroads, uh, Nick kindly provided me this map of your area, which uh, doesn't look familiar to me, but hopefully it looks familiar to some of you. And a couple, just wanted to point out a couple of places here. I've circled in red Union Pier and Pike Pier. And you can see on the map, uh, it shows that the railroad tracks continue out to the pier. Uh, and the yellow arrows show you that quite nearby, there are mills right there. So it'd be very easy, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, timber is actually coming into the pier via railroad and being transported to the mill to be processed, or if the finished product, the, the milled product, is being shipped out, uh, sent to the pier via railroad, and then shipped out to places like Chicago. Uh, so it's yeah, easier to transport things. And a, a very interesting thing uh, is that if you can read here where my cursor is, it says horse railroad. Uh, so some of these railroads weren't a uh, steam powered locomotive. They were actually on rails, but they were be the cars were being pulled by horses. So with all this technology, of course, comes larger logging operations. And we're not in a shanty anymore. We don't just have 10 to 12 people. Now we're a small town. We have 100 or more not just men, we have women and children living and working in these logging camps. And the image on the left, you can see kind of uh, your typical bunkhouse image. So there might be a hundred men sharing one bunkhouse. They have to share a bed with one another. Uh, it's a pretty um, smelly place. And, and on the right, you get this image of a logging camp. You can see all the different buildings, the people, it's a little chaotic. Uh, you can even see uh, if I can find my cursor in the background here, the narrow gauge railroad comes right through camp. And uh, some local operations that were happening in your neck of the woods in the 1860s and 70s. And this is hardwood logging, predominantly in your area, uh, more hardwood than pine. So 
on the left, I'll circle it here with my cursor. This is Bennett's sawmill and they made broom handles. And here I uh, do have image of the Bennett Brothers Broom Handle Factory in Three Oaks in 1868. And same image, but on the right, this larger mill is the pipe mill. And I love in the kind of the middle ground here, you can see all these large trees, uh, all large um, timber ready to uh, go up into the mill. And uh, this, they made water pipes, mainly from ash and tulip poplar. And it was founded in the early 1860s by Thomas Farrington and John Temple. And here is an image of one of those water pipes. So uh, briefly, life in a logging camp, what, what was it like? It was, uh, you know, probably chaotic. It was, I mentioned earlier with the bunkhouse, it definitely would have been smelly. People leave behind journals talking about uh, that the bunkhouses were full of lice and fleas and bed bugs. They're sleeping on straw mattresses mostly. Uh, there was something called the two week rule, which is uh, you take a bath once every two weeks. So think about men working six days a week, sun up till sundown, uh, working a very physically intense job, and they're only taking a bath once every two weeks. <laughs> So think about the smell in camp. And of course we have our wool socks and leather boots hanging up to dry up here. Uh, this man is posing with a washboard. So on Sundays, that was wash day or boiling day. And they would literally boil their clothes to kill all the lice. <laughs> and uh, music, this man in front, he's holding a fiddle. Music was a really important uh, part of camp life. And these jobs were so good that people came from all over the world to work in Michigan logging camps. They were a very good paying job. Uh, in the 1890s, these lumberjacks would make about a dollar a day. In today's dollars, if that was your full-time job, that's about a $40,000 salary. And uh, you don't pay room and board, that's included in your wage. You don't, yeah, you don't cook any of your own meals. Uh, there's no income tax in the 1890s. So it really was a very good job and it attracted people from all over the world. That means most likely even the men in this photograph, they're all speaking different languages. And I, I'm sure they picked up on some English, but uh, in the evening in camp, you wanna blow off steam, have fun. And if you don't all speak the same language, that could be difficult but we do know they loved music because it doesn't matter what language you speak. You can enjoy a song. Uh, you, we know they danced, they, they sang, uh, they played, yeah, whether it was a fiddle, a harmonica, a jaw harp, um, they absolutely loved music. And of course, mealtime is crucial uh, at camp. These are very hardworking men and we know that they eat 6,000 to 8,000 calories a day because they need so much energy to do their job. And uh, especially at breakfast, you only got 15 minutes to eat and uh, you're being paid to work, not to eat. And uh, the most important rule at mealtime was absolutely no talking. And uh, when we present to our school groups, they all get a kick out of that. <laughs> and of course, animals were, were vital to the logging operation. Um, of course, by the 1870s, we have that railroad technology, but the only way to get the trees out of the forest is with horses or with oxen. By the 1870s, they're still using oxen here and there, but mostly they're using horses. Uh, oxen can walk really long distances and they don't tire out, but horses are faster. They can't go as far, but it doesn't matter. We're only going maybe a quarter mile, half mile, hauling these logs to the railroad car or to the riverbank. So uh, every logging camp by the 1870s is probably gonna have uh, a few dozen horses around. And uh, we do know that the horses were treated impeccably because they are vital to this operation. And of course, river drives, uh, if even when the narrow gauge railroad comes into use, river drives are still happening uh, in all the navigable rivers. 
here in northern Michigan and in the Upper Peninsula. Life on a River Drive, uh, so it, it's happening in the spring and you have the spring thaw, so rivers are higher, they're flowing faster. So this means this water is icy cold. It's springtime in northern Michigan. Uh, you can see these, the men in this photo, their, their pants are visibly wet. Uh, they're in this cold, icy water all day long. And this is an image of a Wanigan. This is just the raft that houses uh, the, the shelter where they would sleep at night and uh, where the cook would live and, and prepare their meals and where they would come to eat. And of course, one of the things, uh, the river drivers or river hogs or river rats, they have a few different names. They feared a log jam, which is what you see in this photo. And to give you a perspective of how uh, large this log jam is, there are several people, you can see my cursor here, uh, there are several people standing on this log jam. We have a bridge in the background here. And this looks like a pretty severe log jam. Probably the, one of the only ways to get rid of this is to blow it up with dynamite, which of course is gonna be dangerous for the men working the drive. It's also destroying the product. So the people doing the drive are gonna do everything they can to avoid the log jam. They don't wanna damage bridges, they don't wanna hurt themselves, and uh, they don't wanna damage the product because that's less they might get paid in the end. And this gives an idea of, of at the end, uh, these men probably all work for what is called a booming company. So uh, a booming company are actually the men uh, that are gonna sort the logs. They also build dams on the rivers. So the spring thaw comes, the dam's already in place. The water gets held back by the dam. The boom company breaks the dam on purpose so that all, uh, all this force of water carries the logs down the river to the next dam, and then they break that dam, and so on and so forth. So the boom company is responsible for that process. They're also going to sort the logs, what you see here. Uh, they're sorting them by log mark, so that when the logs arrive at the mill, we know which log belongs to which company, so that uh, the owner of that company or a representative from that logging company can show up to the mill and get paid. That's what they've done all this hard work for. And here, uh, of course, close to home for you, this is the Galeen River. And uh, unfortunately, the Galeen is a little too winding and full of snags to be used for river drives. And this actually reminds me, I mentioned at Hartwick Pines, there's no navigable river nearby. Uh, the Asable River is navigable, but we have the East Branch of the Asable, which runs through the park, and it looks very similar to this image here. Uh, too narrow, winding, lots of snags, so it'd be too difficult to, to have a river drive. And uh, this man here, this is Henry Chamberlain. He's an early settler of New Buffalo, and he used the river, but not for a river drive. Uh, he actually uh, would put timber on a scow and uh, use the river that way. So I'll go ahead and read this quote from him. The work of loading wood was hard. The placing of it on the scow, the pulling of the scow down to the mouth of the river, and the pulling of it out to the vessel by a line. And by that, I'm assuming he means I'm actually pulling the scow out to the vessel. Uh, and sometimes when the current was strong out of the mouth of the river, it was a difficult matter to turn the boat against the current. I at one time worked at this business for 48 consecutive hours, stopping only long enough to eat my meals. So you can see um, whether you're using a, a scow or working a river drive, uh, it was very intense, uh, strenuous and dangerous work. And all of this use of rivers, of course, was, was devastating. Uh, you can see on the left here, just kind of the wasteland that's left behind. Um, if you've ever gone kayaking or canoeing on a Michigan River, you know that typically you're going to have down trees around, uh, along a river that you have to paddle around. But 
if you're a logging company doing a river drive, you don't want that stuff in the way. That's going to hang up your logs. So the booming company would go through the river and remove all of those snags. Snags are great habitat for fish spawning. It creates quiet little eddies uh, where fish can lay their eggs. So now we've destroyed a lot of fish habitat. And on the right, you can see a lot of Michigan rivers uh, to get the log into the river, they would use this system uh, called a, a log slide and they would slide the logs down the bank, of course, leading to immense uh, erosion. And in this image too, you can see some of that uh, flooding most likely caused by a dam somewhere downstream uh, that's holding the water back. And of course we have bank erosion, flooding that shouldn't typically happen. So we're really destroying uh, a lot of habitat and different ecosystems. And then of course our forests are devastated by these logging practices. Uh, you can see kind of the, the, the stumps left behind, the erosion that takes place. Um, if you, you know, took a road trip up north to Mackinac City in say 1910, it, was a, it would look like this. It was not a, a beautiful ride to take. And these logging practices lead to devastating forest fires. Of course, forest fires happen naturally. Uh, native people utilized forest fires, but these logging practices lead to terribly uh, ter terrible forest fires that happen again and again, very unnatural. So what happens is the logging companies just want the trunk of the tree. They don't want the branches, they don't want the top, and that all gets left behind in what we call slash. So there are slash piles all over the place, which creates perfect tinder. And uh, in 1871, when Chicago burns, Michigan also burns from Lake Michigan all the way across to Lake Huron. Uh, it was a very dry summer and uh, it was a devastating year for forest fires. That particular fire burned 2.5 million acres here in Michigan. It destroyed 3,000 buildings and it killed 200 people. And uh, the day before Chicago burns, Peshtigo, Wisconsin also burns and it is still today the deadliest forest fire ever and over a thousand people were killed. And by 1912, uh, it's estimated that more Michigan trees were destroyed by fire than by logging. That's how much of a problem these fires were. And on the right, this is an image from uh, the Metz fire, which took place in 1908. And Metz is a, a village that was near Alpena. And you can see uh, the heat of the fire twisted the tracks. And this is a, a very famous image from Clare County. You can see the, the terrible soil erosion that took place after all these trees die and the root systems shrink and they can't hold on to that, that soil anymore. And a lot of these logging companies, after they cut over the land, they advertise it as farmland. Yeah, here in Northern Michigan, we have spots of good farmland, but for the most part where the white pine grows, it's sandy, it's acidic soil, good for pine trees and not good for much else. So logging companies advertise this farmland, unsuspecting people buy it, it's already been cleared, the hard part was already done, and most of the time their farms fail. And what we end up with is uh, a lot of tax reverted lands. A lot of this land uh, ends up in state control. And uh, it's really evident in counties like Crawford County where, where Grayling and Hartwick Pines are uh, a very large percentage of the county today is public land, which, whether that's state or, or federal, uh, because of this, because of all this tax reverted land. And uh, even in the country, we are one of the states with the, the highest percentage of public land. And this is one of the reasons. And of course, many species, uh, they weren't extinct, they were extirpated, meaning they could no longer live here. Uh, species like the pine martin on the right, the, the wolf, the gray wolf on the bottom, and on the left, the arctic grayling, which uh, many rivers here in Michigan was home to the grayling. 
they were overfished, of course, but uh, they also suffered from extreme habitat loss. Uh, they need very cold, clean water to survive. We made our water too warm because we cut down all the shady trees and we made it so dirty by all that erosion that took place. But now it's 2020. Let me do a quick check of the time. I'm doing okay. All right, so it's 2020 and uh, Michigan is known as the trail state. People come from all over the world to hike our beautiful trails, to see our gorgeous forests, um, to kayak, canoe, our pristine waters. Uh, we have world-class fly fishing up here in Northern Michigan. And of course, uh, a species people come literally from all over the world to see is the Kirtland's warbler, uh, which just a year ago was delisted from the endangered species list. So really a success story. And we, how do we go from all this devastation, you know, our forests are destroyed, people are losing their land, our rivers are destroyed, habitat is lost. Uh, and today we really are this recreation Mecca. Anything, you, almost anything you can think of doing outdoors, you can come to Michigan and do it. Uh, anything from snowboarding to ice climbing, um, yeah, fly fishing, birding, all of these things. So how did we get here? Well, the first thing that happened was uh, in 1899, Michigan formed a forestry commission. And in 1903, they opened our first state nursery uh, at Higgins Lake. And it's on the north shore of Higgins Lake. Uh, it's in what is today North Higgins Lake State Park. And it operated from 1903 to 1965. And it really was uh, a huge experimental effort in the first decade or so. People, you know, up till 1900 had greenhouses, you know, people had businesses where they grew ornamental trees, decorative uh, trees and flowers. And in Europe, there were small patches of managed forests, but nobody had ever tried to regrow and replant millions of acres of forests. It had never happened. So it was this uh, huge experiment. Uh, how do you properly harvest the seeds? How deep do you plant the seeds? How close together do you plant them? Uh, how long do we let them grow before we transplant them? All of these questions had to be answered. So really by about 1915, they get the hang of things. And by the 1920s, the nursery looks uh, something like this. At the height of its operation, it was 48 acres. And uh, you can see all these little, uh, these little squares. These are all seedlings. It kind of looks like sod. That's how uh, close together the seedlings grow. And in the 1920s, this was the largest pine nursery in the world, shipping out 20 million seedlings a year, uh, mostly here to Michigan to replant our forests. Uh, here's a few images of nursery workers. These images are probably from the 1950s. Have some ladies on the left bundling seedlings. And uh, here on the right, you see some bundles of seedlings ready to be shipped. There's probably, uh, in each one of these bundles, probably about 200 seedlings. And of course, a huge piece of this puzzle uh, was firefighting and fire prevention and uh, education. So of course, uh, this is a very modern image of Smokey Bear on the right, on top of the Mackinac Bridge. This is, uh, was taken last year, but uh, in the 1920s and 30s, Michigan put a lot of money into fire prevention education. Of course, in the, the 20s and 30s, we see all of a sudden lots of people going on road trips and car camping. So there's this generation of people that have never done this before. They, they don't understand fire safety in the outdoors. So there's all this, uh, there's all these billboards put up, you know, make sure your fire is totally out, um, dump water on it, don't throw your cigarettes out of your car. And uh, there's also a lot of work being done with railroad companies to put spark arresters onto steam engines because that was a huge cause of forest fires here in Michigan. And uh, in the, uh, the left image here, you have a very early version of a fire tower. You can see it's open air, um, probably 40 to 50 feet high. And uh, that, that man up there is gonna work probably a, a 10 hour shift or so. And he is just a serving for smoke. Uh, you can come to the Higgins Lake Nursery today and see Michigan's first fire tower, uh, which does look just like this one. And by the 1920s, things are a little 
more modern. And you get the, the tower that looks like the center image here. This is the Hale Fire Tower, uh, which was near Tawas. And this fire tower is about 100 feet high, an enclosed cabin up top, so you're out of the elements. And uh, a lot of these fire towers here in Michigan, we had about 150 of them. They're, they're in rural locations. So if you did spot a fire, you would report via a radio and uh, you would probably share a shift with one other person. And when you're not working, you live in the cabin at the foot of the tower. And then of course, we have the Civilian Conservation Corps, uh, which operates from 1933 to 1942. And if this program hadn't have happened, in my opinion, we would be decades behind where we are now uh, in conservation efforts in Michigan. So uh, these CCC boys, as they always called themselves, they uh, were doing tons of conservation work. Uh, we had about 124 CCC camps throughout the state, throughout the history of the program. And uh, this of course is a federal program, a national program. It's part of FDR's New Deal, uh, one of the programs he put together. Now the CCC was only for young men or veterans, uh, but there were other New Deal programs that women could be a part of. Uh, but this camp-based program was just for men. And on the left, you can see they're working on some stream rehabilitation, uh, perhaps building a dam. It's a little hard to tell there. Uh, they also put back a lot of those downed trees, those snags in the river, so that there were those quiet places uh, for fish to lay their eggs. And on the right, of course, you have a CCC boy planting a tree. They did a lot of that. And uh, I, I know this is a long list. I will read it. Uh, so here we have two images of um, CCC camps. The image on the left uh, is from Camp Bightley. So in 1935, the CCC was segregated. So uh, here in Michigan, we did have 11 African-American camps. Camp Bightley was one of them. And on the right, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is an image from Camp Manistee River. And uh, this is a veteran company. So you notice the men, most of the men in this image are older because they're uh, World War I or even Spanish American War veterans. And uh, I'll read this list of all the amazing things they did. Uh, so like I said, there were 124 CCC camps here in Michigan. The boys made $30 a month and 25 was sent directly home to their families or put into a savings account if they, if they didn't have a family. So they only really kept $5 a month. It was a six month commitment. Uh, you could re-up, many boys did. And these are just Michigan facts. So here in Michigan, they planted 484 million trees, over twice as many as any other state. They built 7,000 miles of roads and 504 bridges. Most of those roads were forest roads that doubled as fire breaks. So that's another method of fire prevention so that uh, if there is a fire, hopefully it won't jump the road, it gives you a break in fuel. They spent 140,000 man days fighting forest fires. They brought electricity and phone service to a lot of rural Michigan. They built state park infrastructure. They literally constructed the Sini National Wildlife Refuge, all the dams and dikes and, and ponds, they, they built and dug all of that. Uh, they, uh, Isle Royal National Park, all the trails and structures, they built all of that. Uh, education was a huge component of the CCC. So hundreds of eighth grade diplomas were earned. Uh, high school degrees were earned. Some of the boys were even able to take correspondence courses through the University of Michigan. And uh, most enrollees gained 10 to 15 pounds within the first three months of the program. So think about, you know, the midst of the Great Depression, when these boys are at home, there's not a lot of food to go around. So now they, they come to this camp, it's run by the War Department, they're getting three squares a day, uh, and they very quickly gain weight, but, but also muscle, they're working hard on these projects. And overall, in Michigan, enrollees sent 
$20 million home to their families. Uh, so think about the money going into local communities, both by uh, the money these men are sending home to their families, but also these camps, these 124 camps, they have to buy supplies from surrounding towns. So money is also going into local communities that way. And uh, thanks to the reforestation of the Higgins Lake Nursery, the, the work that the CCC did and um, the forestry work that continues today, Michigan, uh, we are the 10th largest forested state with 20 million acres, even though uh, we're only the 22nd largest state by landmass. And uh, we are still very much, just like in 1903, uh, today we are still very much at the forefront of forest management science and uh, forest and wildland firefighting technology. Uh, some of you maybe have heard of the Forest Fire Experiment Station in Roscommon, operated by the DNR. Uh, it's just what it sounds like. They experiment uh, with different methods of, of fighting forest fires and they, they build um, their own equipment to fight forest fires. And uh, the logging era's impact is still very evident if you know where to look. Uh, come to a place like Hartwick Pines, we have a stump field. It's a spot that was logged in the 1890s and then fire came through time and time again, literally cooked the nutrients out of the soil. Uh, and even today, over a hundred years later, there's not enough nutrients in that soil uh, for large trees to grow. It's a very grassy, shrubby kind of area. And uh, if you're curious, this pie chart on the right gives an idea of what these, these 20 million forested acres look like today. Of course, the largest piece of the pie, that blue piece, uh, it's family owned, privately owned at 9.2 million acres or 46%. Uh, the purple slice on the left is uh, state owned, so that's um, me, the DNR, uh, 4.2 million acres or 21%. Uh, something, uh, so corporate, 2.6 million acres, that's going to be like uh, Warehouser, Georgia Pacific, Nina Paper, those kinds of places that own their own corp corporate forests uh, for the forest products industry. And there is all my contact information if you want to uh, send me an email or, or these days I'm mostly working from home. So that second number there uh, is going to be the best way to get hold of me. And you can always just go to the Michigan History Center's website and find all my information as well. Thanks, Hillary. Great. Um... There are no questions in chat right now. I, I had one about the Chicago fire. I mean, do you, do you have any sort of uh, way of quantifying what that did for demand for lumber? My impression has always been that this area, it made a great deal of difference that suddenly there was a huge market. And of course, we're pretty close to Chicago. Mm -hmm. But do you, do you, you listed it as one of the factors uh, in logging in that time. But do you know, was, was, did it just continue the pace of logging or did it, uh, did it create a boom? It definitely created a, a, a boon. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't know any hard numbers, but it was one of those driving factors like, oh, it's not just here or there or building here or there or somebody's building a, a railroad and needs some lumber. It was this, um, this major city that had to be completely rebuilt. So uh, it did have a significant impact on demand. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have hard numbers for that. So, sorry. And, and then on the, the question of the, uh, oh wait, we have a, a quick question here in chat. Uh, are there any records of the men who worked in the logging companies? So it, that's an interesting question, a hard one to answer. Uh, if you can find the records, there might be. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm mostly interested so the logging company that operated in and around Hartwick Pines and in the Grayling area was the Salling Hansen and Company. And uh, so that's the company whose records I'm primarily interested in. And uh, of course, it seems like all newspapers records, right? There was always a fire. So <laughs> at some point in time, uh, a bunch of their records were destroyed by fire. Um, this was a very a nomadic lifestyle. Uh, a lot of men uh, were French Canadian, for example, they owned farms, they just came over for the winter to work. So I have seen, for example, in the, the Salling Hansen and Company records, if somebody gets injured, they say, oh, 
Mr. Smith cut off his thumb, we paid him five dollars. Uh, so you might find people's names that way. I've never come, doesn't mean they're not out there. I just have not come across, uh, you know, like a, a roster of employees for a company. So you'd have to know, I think very specifically, the name of a company or, or a mill and, you know, go to an archive or a, a museum or library and, and seek out those records and see what's there. We have another observation um, that uh, Barbara says her neighbor got some of those pine seed seedlings in the 1920s and planted them on the dune. Many of the pines are still there, but never spread to adjoining properties. I know my father, uh, I think through the CCC, but maybe another government program, talked of spending a long time uh, planting pine seedlings along Kaiser Road, where his father owned property. Um, so the, not all the kids, he was maybe 15 or something, not all the kids were in these camps. Uh, there was a lot of planting going on, I guess. Was that also the CCC? Uh, yes, probably. Um, so a lot of the, the boys would be trucked around uh, and there were side camps. So uh, those are not included in that 124 number of camps. Um, you know, if say in the summer, oh, there's this one place that needs, we're gonna go plant trees or we're gonna go do stream rehabilitation, but it's just a project that's gonna take two months. They would just go set up some tents in like a field kitchen. They wouldn't build a whole camp around it. They would just send, you know, a small core cohort of men to work on that project. So uh, it's very possible it was a, a CCC project. They were all over the state. It was stag staggering to me that the CCC planted twice as many trees as in Michigan than in any other state. Is there an explanation for why that imbalance would be so great? I think it really speaks to the amount of reforestation that we needed after the logging era. I think that is the, the main explanation for that. I think other states, you know, think about uh, there were a lot of CCC camps out west. They were mostly working on soil erosion issues. Think about the Dust Bowl happening at that time. Um, so yes, they're they're replanting in the south. They're doing some of that, but there are other conservation needs in other states. Not so much replanting. And someone uh, says, I grew up in the Thumb of Michigan near Bayport. They had great fire in 1881. I believe there was a logging mill when I was young. Do you know much about that area? I don't, um, but I do know about, yeah, that the Thumb Fire of 1881. Yeah, it's very, very well known. Again, that was a very destructive fire. Many people were killed. I've heard stories of, you know, people had to, to hide in their wells. People had to uh, literally jump into Lake Huron while the fire was raging. Yeah, it was very devastating. Well, we're at the museum. We are going to have an exhibit this coming year, I think, on uh, the fires of 1871, because it's 150 anniversary, 150 year anniversary. And so I was interested in that part of it. And uh, I know that around the Three Oaks, the, this area, there was a huge uh, problem with that. And I, I came across a great quote by a, a pioneer named Emma Thayer, who said, one Sunday during the time of the Chicago fire, the people were in church when the alarm was given that the town was in danger. All the men jumped up and ran out of the church to fight the fire. Bun Giot, G-I-O-T, don't really know how to spell, uh, pronounce his name, split his best coat down the back, much to his sorrow. And she said, the ashes made it appear dark here. So the Chicago fire really was uh, a, sort of an area-wide, a region-wide phenomenon, even though obviously the city burning down was the, the headline. Wayne um, asks, how old were the boys in the camps? Uh, so the, if you're asking about CCC camps, um, the typical age was 17 to 25. Uh, towards the end of the program, those restrictions were loosened a little bit, but that was the, the main age range. Of course, it depends. when you look at some CCC photos, you're like, man, there is no way that kid is 17. <laughs> so I think there was probably a lot of instance of you'd go to your local, uh, the word is escaping me at the moment, uh, the, anyways, the, the office where you would uh, enroll or apply for the CCC. And uh, if this person was local and happened to know you and know your family was having a lot of financial hardships, they could definitely fudge the records. Because <laughs> sometimes, yeah, you look at these photos and they're, there's no way they're 17. Uh, but then of course there were the veterans of World War I or the Spanish-American War that were also in the camps. Um, if you're asking about logging camps, uh, you'd have a whole it, it, large age range. Um, 
you know, that there, we know there were kids that worked in camps, kids uh, maybe even as young as eight. Uh, they only get paid 25 cents a day. They're doing things like helping take care of the animals. They're cleaning around camp. They're also working on the road crew, helping, um, you know, like toss sawdust in the tracks in the wintertime to slow down the sleds, that kind of stuff. Uh, yes, I see the chat. My name is Hillary Pine. <laughs> <laughs> Did you change it for show business or? Yeah, no, and actually um, I got married a couple years ago and I did not change my name because it was too perfect. And um, to make things even more funny, my dad was a forester. So <laughs> everything came full circle. Uh, All right. Well, if there's anybody who wants to unmute themselves and ask a question, you're free to do so. We're pretty much out of the questions in here. There is a suggestion, by the way, on how to find loggers and census records uh, uh, for the person who asked that question um, in the chat. So you might want to check that. Yeah, it's going to depend. Like I said, a lot of people were farmers. A lot of times people would log in the winter. They blow their money. So once the, the spring logging uh, or the winter logging ended, they get paid. They go to towns like Bay City where you have Hell's Half Mile, which is the strip of bars, or, you know, they go to Manistee and they blow their money in a couple weeks on, you know, booze and women. <laughs> and uh, it could be a pretty violent time. And uh, then they'd have to go to work in a mill in the summer. And uh, the mill jobs weren't quite as good because the mills didn't provide room and board like a logging company did. Are there logging ghost towns in Michigan, places where that boomed during when there was timber and then just dried up? There are many, many. Uh, I know just in the Grayling area, there's a, uh, an area called DeWard. So it was a, a man named David Ward, D. Ward. So it's called DeWard now. And uh, he also had an apple orchard. He had a mill, he logged. So there was quite a town. Uh, it's state owned today. You can go in there and hike and um, you can see foundation still of the mill. Um, so it's definitely a ghost town. Uh, there uh, is a place also in the Grayling area called uh, Pear Cheney. That is a ghost town. Uh, yeah, there are many. Just in Hartwick Pines, we have a, I don't know that you'd call it a ghost town, but remnants of some, some kind of railroad siding towns. Mm -hmm. Is there any way we could get the slideshow emailed to us or, or can we access it at the website? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, you recorded. I, the, the program is being recorded and I'm going to try and kind of edit it uh, slightly and put it on the museum's website. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, but that's a possibility. Um, Hillary, the Hartwick Pines is an amazing place to visit, um, but I'm always confused as to what those pines represent. Were they true virgin that never got timbered or they reforested? Yeah, good question. So um, both. Uh, the the old growth forests that we're known for is virgin. It was never cut. Uh, and uh, today we have about 49 acres of old growth left. We're the, the largest stand of old growth left in the uh, uh, old growth pine left in the lower peninsula. And today the park is almost 10,000 acres. So the logging company that was operating in the 1890s, they were logging 8,000 acres and uh, most of that is still on the state park property today. So you can go see the stumps uh, in that stump field I mentioned. So, well, so they did do a bunch of logging there, but we also have old growth that they did not log. Um, a few different reasons because of that, uh, but one of the big ones would be they just weren't big enough. Uh, you know, obviously where that 8,000 acres is, uh, there must have been larger white pine to cut. We have a question about a gigantic statue of Paul Bunyan, I presume, in Michigan. Any ideas about that? Uh, yeah. Let's see. Where is that? I've been asked that before. Um, is it? I think it's in Oscoda, maybe? Somewhere on Lake Huron. It's not It's not at Hartwood Pines or, or Grayling. Not Oscoda. It's, I think it's somewhere in that area. Somewhere. Um, it's somewhere. <laughs> I've I've Googled, people have call, literally called Hartwick looking for it, and um, so I've had to Google it and <laughs> send people to the right place. Um, well, now there's one in Wisconsin, northern Wisconsin, Paul Bunyan. 
Yeah. There's also a large Paul Bunyan and Babe uh, at Castle Rock in St. Ignace. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and what about women in the logging camps? Who were they and how many were? Yeah. So we know some camps didn't have women at all. Uh, some camps did. Typically, if there are women in camp, they are the camp cook, um, most likely the head cook and cook's assistants. Uh, we do know there were single women that did that job, but more likely uh, their husband was probably someone, not a lumberjack, someone of a little bit higher standing in camp, maybe the blacksmith, maybe the teamster, the guy in charge of the horses. Um, and actually, uh, something I find extremely interesting, if you were the head cook in a logging camp, even as a woman in the 1890s, you got paid more than everybody else in camp. So uh, your lumberjack, typical lumberjack might be making a dollar a day, and the head cook might make $2.50 to $3 a day. But they never get a day off because everyone always has to eat. So, <laughs> and they work really long hours. Um, the cook might make something like 20 pies a day, 100 loaves of bread every other day. Um, so, you know, it's an immense amount of food that they're responsible for. All right. The Paul Bunyan statue may be, let's see, is near Thunder Bay River State Forest. Yeah, yeah. it was near Alpena. Or ask on a, see, thunder. Yep, that's where the Thunder Bay River is. <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you so much, Hillary. I really appreciate it. Uh, the talk was just as good as I remembered it from uh, when you did it a few weeks ago. And, and we have a lot of nice compliments in the uh, comments section along with some of these questions. Um, so uh, unless we have further questions, I guess I'll adjourn the meeting with thanks. <laughs>